Welcome to exam number one. Oh, there we're getting our own welcome. Exam number one for ECE 320 in spring 2012. I hope that's the right semester. Does that seem right to you? I'm going to sit down, see how long that lasts. What I I have no clue what we're going to do right now, but here are the exam topics for the exam, and really the first pieces are associated with material that you should already have known from ECE 220. That's our working with sinusoidal steady state analysis, what's going on with that, how do you convert time domain waveforms? Now, we're going to start doing our exercises. Can everybody stand, lie down so you can see that? Then we'll, if my buttons will work, we will be on our heads now. And now you'll roll over onto the other side. And finally, you can come back up to a position of taking notes, I hope. And we'll move forward. You should be able to convert between sines and cosines, or convert sines and cosines into phasors, knowing what is going on with that. Your circuit analysis techniques, KVL, KCL, mesh, nodal, all of those need to be firmly in hand so that you can do the other material which is really focused on single phase power and three phase power. With chapter 10, you need to be able to use and work with complex power. Obviously, I should have bolded those expressions. Those are phasors. S is equal to V phasor I star phasor. And the V and the I are in what magnitude units, if that expression is true. You need to convert those to RMS units so that you can use that formula as it exists or as it stands in that expression. If I give you reactive power or give you real power, can you use that information to create the complex power? Can you find the power factor associated with a load or the total loads? How do you combine loads in combination if those are in parallel? Typically, that's how they are added together at the end of a transmission line, but I could give you something in series and you need to be able to work with that if given that configuration. Power factor, I guess I could also include reactive factor. What's that? There you just use the sine of your angle and the angle, what's the angle? Theta sub V minus theta sub I, or it's the angle of the impedance, is another way of thinking of that or keeping track of that. Know that lagging power factor means you have an inductive load. Leading means you have a capacitive type load. You need, if you're working with currents or voltages, we're working with phasor quantities, and those add vectorially. You can't just go in and add magnitudes. And that's what I'm hoping to make clear at the bottom. Like one of the homework problems, you should be able to compute, given a generic waveform that's periodic, can you compute its RMS value? And that RMS value can then be used as if it was a DC and you now had a DC type impedance associated with it or a resistor. Then in chapter 11, we get into our three-phase power, and now you really should be able to keep all the other tools in play, but now you're working with 
three different phases. Know the whether you have a positive phase sequence or a negative phase sequence. Know how to do all the transformations that we talked about in class today, whether you need to convert loads from Y to delta or delta to Y. You need to be able to create that, do those transformations so that you can come up with a YY three-phase system that's balanced and now you can extract or pull out the single phase equivalent and do your analysis based on that diagram or that circuit. Once you have that, now you can pretty much answer any of the questions that I hope to present to you. Questions on the topics that are fair game for Thursday. Does anyone have a question on material? We pro since we didn't really talk too much about power meters and how to physically measure this in a system, we won't go into that on this exam. But it might be useful information in the future if you now start working for someone and they start asking you to take measurements. But hopefully knowing what you know now, that gives you the background to step into and digest that material in the textbook. But you won't be held responsible for that section on exam number one. I'm still holding open the possibility that maybe it's available for a future exam, but not this one. So I'm saying it's not for exam number one. I don't know that I repeated the question, but the question is, are we going to be responsible for setting up power meters so that we can determine current and voltage in a given circuit? And I'm saying no, not for exam number one. Other questions? Has everyone already digested the practice exam? Pardon? It is on D2L, hopefully, and if you have problems accessing any of that, please let me know. But would you want me to work through some of these, or do you want me to try to look at some other problems that maybe are slightly different from this practice exam? Can we do something slightly different? Man. Yes, you do. You, you have the exam that does not have any solutions, which I have here. And so that's going to really test my skills to try to work those. But you do, if you now sit down and try to work this, you can check your answers with the material. There's another posted PDF file that does contain the solutions. And I would recommend that you look over and try to work through some of these problems on your own and then look at the solutions if we don't go through those today. Let's look at something that's a little different maybe that I thought about. I was talking to somebody in office hours one time relative to one of the homework problems, which I'm hoping is somewhat correct. I copied this down from my notes because I was thinking about it. This is what you do, I guess, when you're traveling. You think about what you should have said during office hours or what you didn't say. And now I can't see you guys, so you're, you can make all sorts of faces you want with me, but I'm going to be taking those off and on. Problem 10.6 was the circuit that I believe it asked you. I didn't write it down, but it asked I just sketched the circuit. It was asking for, oh, now I sort of remember, the power absorbed by this 30 ohm resistor over here on the right. Do you remember that? And I don't know if I've copied this down correctly or not. 
you had a dependent voltage source that actually dependent on, depended on this vertical inductor. You had a current source I sub G, and I believe you were told that I sub G of T was equal to 6 cosine of 20,000 T amps. Your problem or ultimate goal was to find the power absorbed by that 30 ohm resistor on the far right. And I believe I set that up to do node voltage analysis. And as I was thinking about it, you actually can work this using mesh analysis if you want. Meaning, and I know that it seems like a lot of students feel more comfortable playing with mesh analysis. I don't know what why that is. But if you said, let me do mesh analysis and, oh, before we do that, though, maybe we should convert this into the phaser domain or into the frequency domain. Because we are in sinusoidal steady state, we're asking about the real power absorbed by that resistor. We can think that this has now been operating for a long time. We are in sinusoidal steady state. Let's now put this into the frequency domain. We won't worry about converting those. Let me just sketch the circuit that we will work with. The impedance of the inductor becomes J10, and we should anticipate that that's positive since it's an inductor. I'm going to call that variable in our dependent voltage source, capital I sub delta. Our capacitor ends up being minus J40 at the appropriate frequency of 20,000 radians per second. Whoops. My handwriting is so sloppy on my paper that I thought that was an inductor, but that's what we're supposed to be finding the power from. And what current do I want to use for my current source, or what value to make things a little easier with our expressions, you'll want to convert that into an RMS value. You'll divide that 6 by the square root of 2, and now you have the structure that you need. What you will be wanting to find is this current coming down through there. And if we're going to do this with mesh analysis, We would have a current here, let's say it's I1, and now we have this current I2. And if we could find I2, then the power of the 30 is simply going to be I sub 2's magnitude squared times R, which is 30. Where you might start getting hung up if you're doing mesh analysis is you might be saying, wait a minute. I don't know the voltage drop across that current source. And when you start doing mesh analysis, when you have sources, you need to pay attention to that. In this case, actually what you're saying is, oh, I sub 1 is defined. It's equal to that current source. And now, effectively, you've eliminated that particular unknown variable, I sub 1 bar by definition is now this 6 over the square root of 2. Does everybody see that? And so now you don't have to worry about doing KVL around that left mesh. It's given that I1 bar is now 6 over the square root of 2. We can now start writing KVL around the right mesh. which will be the impedance J10. And now what do I multiply that by? I sub delta? Or which way? I'm actually 
I like to write my KVLs in a clockwise fashion, which means that now I'm wanting to consider a positive voltage drop across J10 from the basement up to the top. I want my positive to be plus to minus from bottom to top through that J10, which means I want a net positive current going up, and that will be true if I sub 2 minus I1 is positive meaning I now am going to be saying that the drop positive to negative from bottom to top through that J10 is now J10 times I2 minus I1. And that will give me my positive, if I2 is bigger than I1, then I have my positive drop from bottom to top through J10. The next element that I come into that comes into play is the dependent source. That's now plus. I entered it into the plus terminal, and I don't know if this polarity marking is consistent with the book. I just sort of pulled, tried to remember the problem, so this may not be the same polarity from left to right, but let's just play that it is. Okay, so the polarity seems to be okay. Okay, so we have plus 30 I delta, that's the direction we were going in, and now we have the capacitor's impedance, and I don't really worry about the sign of these impedances. The signs will take care of themselves. I just have an impedance that I, I know is minus J40. What do I multiply that by in order to give me the effective, let's say, positive drop with the passive sign convention from plus to minus. It's just going to be times I2. And finally, I have 30 times I2, and now I'm back to where I began. So I'll put this here equal to zero. Questions on that? Yes. The question was, do we want to put the phaser in? You can or can't, or you can or you don't have to if it's zero degrees. You're saying, should I have included this as a phaser. I think that's what you were maybe asking. You can, if that helps you, remember that it's a phaser, but when you're doing the computation, it basically is not a part of your problem if it's hard to find your angle and your symbol on your calculator and put it in. It, your calculator should know that that angle is zero if you put in a real number. Okay. And that's why I didn't, well, I haven't even, now I have three unknowns, technically, in the equation, or three variables in one equation, and I thought, oh, this might be an okay way to solve it. But I do have this, that's known, that's the 6 over the square root of 2. And what do I know about I delta? I delta is I sub 2 minus I sub 1. So I now need, if you look at this, I want my current, net current, to be going down in the direction of I sub delta, and that would be true if I1 minus I2 was equal to I sub delta. Is that clear? And now we can say that here I have I1 minus I2. And again, this I know is 6 over the square root of 2. If you look at that, now the only thing that's unknown is I sub 2. And you can now solve for I sub 2. Hopefully we have some numbers that are in isolation that are not multiplying I sub 2, and we do have a few of those, so we can actually get an answer or a numerical value for I sub 2.
and that in general will be a complex number. And once we have that, we can find the magnitude. Once we have the magnitude, we can put it into our expression and obtain our power absorbed by that 30 ohm resistor. And that may or may not be easier than doing the node voltage analysis. This one may be easier to think about. Maybe you're used to doing the mesh. It's just you have to keep track of things here and know how to define I sub delta in terms of I1 and I2 and also realize that I1 is given for you. It's defined as your source. Questions on that problem? Yes. This is mesh analysis. The way that I solved it in the solutions was actually doing node voltage analysis, meaning I, I think, I said here's a, a voltage V1, and here's another voltage, V sub 2. Those are defined relative to this reference down here. And now I need to find V1 and V2. I actually figured out how to find, I think, V2 in terms of V1, and now I had one equation, V1, that I could solve for V1. Once I had V1, I can now really find V sub 2, and I can divide into V sub 2 the 30 minus J40, which gives me my current through the 30 ohm resistor, and now that should be the same as the I sub 2. And now that I think about it, I believe the final answer of this was supposed to be 600 watts from the solution for that power absorbed by that 30 ohm resistor. Questions on that? What could I give you? I could give you something that's a word problem and ask you to find the three, or I'm sorry, the single phase equivalent to that. Let's see if I can write down something. Suppose that I say, and let's view everything. Are there any questions on what we just finished? Yes. The question was, can we wait until the end on this problem so that we don't have to worry about that square root of 2? And the answer is yes. You would find your current I sub 2 in terms of a maximum value. Now you need to convert that to an RMS and do that at the end. And once you've done that, it should take care of itself. So there you're dealing again with maximum values and you know that if your expressions are in terms of maximum values you need to scale by one half if you've got V times I star for example if that's another way of looking or solving the problem. Other questions? Let's assume that all of these are RMS. quantities, and here's what I say. Let's say that we have a Y-connected generator, obviously if it's Y-connected you have three phase, but we'll say it's a three phase ABC sequence. And I don't know why they didn't call it MBC or Fox, but we'll have to deal with, sorry. Those might have been negative phase C, sorry. <laughs> to 
depending on who you own or what one you own the shares in, right? So let's say that our phase voltage is 120 volts, and this is for the generator. And let's say that the A phase is the reference phase. What's that mean? That its angle is zero. So hopefully that's clear when I start writing some of these problem statements down. Z sub G, what's that represent? That's the generator impedance. Let's say that that's 0 0.05 plus J 0 0.15, and we could convert that to polar if we need to. Are we okay with that terminology, ohm per phase? Now that we're dealing with three phases, this tells us, oh, this is just one of the three impedances. And each phase has that as its generator impedance. What else? Let's say that our load is balanced. And I guess I'm making this fairly easy. Suppose that it's Y connected and the Z load per phase, or I might even call that Y, is 4 plus J3, which is our 3, 4, 5 triangle. And what would you say that, so you could say that that's also ohms per phase. What kind of an impedance is that? Real, capacitive, inductive. It's inductive in nature because of the plus on the reactive part. We also, let's say, have a line impedance. Z sub lowercase l of 0 0.1 plus J 0 0.2. And if we put that into polar form, it's going to be 0 0.224 at an angle of 63.43 degrees. Now, the first thing that you may be asked to find in such a description is the single phase equivalent. And now that everything is in a Y, we don't have to worry about transforming. But what if the load was in a delta? What would you need to do? Pardon? Make it a Y. Remember Superman. <laughs> so if I, gave <laughs> if I gave you a delta, how would you convert it to Y? Divide by 3. Okay? So if I give you the delta, you're dividing by 3 to get the Y, because the Y is inside that triangle. And if I gave you a delta-connected generator, what would you do then? Drop your phone or calculator. If I gave you a delta and I asked for a single phase equivalent circuit, you would need to convert that delta into the Y generator. So now you would need to have the impedance inside the generator, and now that impedance is in a delta configuration. So the question is, for example, if I gave you, this is an aside. Is that clear? This is not the problem. So you wouldn't have to do this in the single phase equivalent. Let me just say aside. If I gave you 
a three phase, so let's say delta connected And now that I'm thinking about it, I probably have my polarities backwards. Let me do it this way. Ah. I think the question was, if this is, let's say, R sub G and this is J X sub G, what do we do with that? We now need to convert this. This is now, remember, Superman. We need to convert these impedances like we would a delta load and can divide those by three to get those into a Y. So you're sort of doing the two pieces independently and putting them back together. Meaning this would be like a delta configured collection of impedances. You now want their Y equivalent. You would divide those by three and put those in. Meaning now you have, you also would need to be told what the phase sequence was. If you have a positive phase sequence, ABC sequence, and you know that this is the VA uh, gets a little messy because, oh, what am I using capital here at the source for? Uh, let me call that A prime. So this would be A prime B. <laughs> Can I be any more mixing of things? What do we know about the... This really is getting more involved than we might want to worry about, but if we had V sub A prime B here, then you would need to be converting that. What's the relationship between, if we didn't have the impedances and we just said V A B, how is that related to the Y connected? If it's a positive phase sequence, isn't this the relationship? And so if you really need to find V sub A N, I would maybe write this down on my crib sheet, and now you would say, oh, V sub A N is now V sub A B over the square root of 3 and divided by this angle 30. Now, if you're given V sub AB, which is what you would be told up here, if this was 5 at 0 degrees, now you have V sub AN is going to be 5 over the square root of 3 at minus 30 degrees. And your other impedance, meaning now you would have your resistor, inductor, and this guy. So this is now V sub A N, and here's little n. This was the 5 over the square root of 3 at minus 30. This is whatever I just had up there. Maybe I should label it with deltas. And now I have R sub G delta over 3, and this is J X sub G delta over 3, and here is now my A terminal on that A phase of my Y, and I'm not going to go ahead and show the different phase phases of that Y connected source. Is that okay? So that ends our aside, and now I've forgotten exact where we were. So now I need to go back to my word problem and find this single phase equivalent. 
we have a Y connected generator which is an ABC sequence, V sub phi is 120, and A phase is the reference. That makes it fairly straightforward, I hope. Now we go back and we say our V sub A in is going to be 120 at 0 degrees. And this is now our A prime, and this is our N. And we had a Z sub G. Here's our A. Then we had a transmission line impedance that was given to us as the line impedance. That was 0 0.1 and J 0 0.2. Then we get to our load terminal, and it was 4 and J3. Here's now N, capital N, and there is our single phase equivalent. Once we have that single phase equivalent, we can start analyzing that however we want to analyze it, meaning we might want to somebody might ask for the line voltage at the load, at the load terminals. But once you have this, you can now find V sub capital A in. Well, you can't find it until you find the line current, I sub AA. But once you have the line current, now you can start finding all these other quantities or expressions. Question? So now if I said what is the line voltage, the line voltage would actually be the voltage between two lines and this is line to neutral and so you would have to find V sub capital A B and that is then this conversion from the Y to delta in your source transformation. Once you find V sub A in, now you have to go through that, and that depends on the phase sequence. Here it was a positive phase sequence. You know now that the line voltage is bigger by a square root of 3, and it leads by an angle of 30 degrees from your phase voltage, which here is V sub A in. Questions on that? Or somebody might ask you, to find the capacitor that allows your load to have a power factor of 1. Is that doable, or do you see what I'm asking there? So here, I mean, you can go through and find all of these. Suppose that you were asked, well, in part B, let's say we want the line currents. How are the line currents related to the phase currents? They're the same, aren't they? Because this is a YY. Our phase currents are identical to the line currents, and we don't have to do any kind of transformation back and forth to get the phase or the line current. Our line current now, in this case, if we can simply compute I sub AA, which is going to be 120 at 0 degrees over the sum of all of those impedances, we have our real pieces, and then we have our imaginary parts. All of that, if you do the algebra, you end up with 22.5 at an angle of minus 38.9 degrees and that's amps, and I said all the quantities to begin with were in RMS, and how is the current, does the current lead or lag the source voltage? I would draw a diagram if it's if it's not clear completely. You now have your 
voltage at 120 at zero degrees. This was V sub A N. That was the source. How, how do you sketch the, and this was a length of 120 at an angle of zero. Where's the current? It's down or behind by about 40 degrees, and so this has a length of 22.5, and this particular angle is 38.9. It's behind. It's lagging your voltage. And what kind of a impedance lags? And, and does that make sense? If you look at your single phase equivalent, the only thing you have in there are inductors. And so this does make sense. Now you're lagging. Your power factor would be lagging, your total power factor. And this is being confirmed by this particular diagram or result that your angle is minus 38.9. Is that making sense? And if somebody, now if if you want I sub BB, what's that? Here's I sub AA, what's I sub BB? Or do you have to solve, do you have to draw another three single phase equivalent for the B to get it? No, because everything is now balanced. Now you just know that if you're dealing with voltages, they're all separated by 120 degrees. The currents are all separated by 120 degrees. And now you know your current in the A phase is minus 38.9. And what do you have to remember about getting the B phase? your phase sequence, right? Whether it's positive or negative, that's going to determine whether you go in what direction from the A phase to get your angle on your B phase current. If it's a positive phase sequence, what do we do with that minus 38? Do we add or subtract 120? And I think on an exam, if you're not asked for the numerical answer, you could even leave it in that form. And then it's clear. You don't have to worry about plugging it in to your calculator. You can say, oh, it's a positive phase sequence. It needs to be minus 120 from where I started. And I started at roughly minus 39. Is that OK? And if you were asked for the C phase, I guess you were asked for all the line currents. Has the same magnitude. And now what do you do? You could subtract 120 from the B phase if you wanted. And then get the final result in between plus and minus 180. Or you could add 120 to the original A phase, which was the minus 38.9, and end up with the proper angle of about 80 degrees. Positive. And that makes sense if you sketch it, hopefully. Then you sketch it and you say, okay, if I walked around that phaser diagram clockwise, I hit A, then I hit B, then I hit C. Okay. That's a positive phase sequence, a way to check your work or check your answer. Questions on that? What's the load phase voltage? Does that terminology throw you? What's the load phase voltage? Is it V sub AB? What was our configuration? It was YY, so we are dealing with the Y, and now we want to know what's the phase voltage, what's the voltage across that impedance element. It's actually 
V sub capital A sub N for the A phase. So now we're looking in this case to find that, and we've just found the current in the A phase, V sub A N is now I sub A A times however I denoted it, Z sub Y of the load. And if you compute that, hopefully, numerically, you would end up with 112.5 at minus 2.03 degrees. And now if you look back, is there any way of checking your work? Well, in this case, since you only really have the one mesh, you should expect that voltage to be less since everything is getting dropped. If you had multiple loads, you could have currents at the load, remember, that might be bigger or exceeding the line current because of the way that the interaction of the reactive components might actually be helping you in terms of what the source sees. But in this case, we started at 120 and we should be dropping from there and we dropped some at the load down to 112. And those are losses because now you're going through the generator, the transmission line, and now you've dropped effectively 8 volts before you get to your load. And that's the price that the power company will basically charge you for is that drop. Now if I ask you for the load line voltage, what am I asking for there? Now you're looking for capital AB, V sub AB. This is now V sub AB at the load end, but now that you have the phase voltage, and you know it's positive phase sequence, this is a pretty easy computation. And you could, I could even say what's V sub BC or what's V sub CA. And you should be able to, I would maybe get V sub AB and then go from there. And this one, V sub AB, because it's positive, it's this square root of 3 at 30 degrees different from V sub AN. And this is now, if you, this might be something that you physically go out and measure in the field. Now you have these two transmission lines and you can put your voltmeter across those. Maybe you don't have access to the neutral terminal. And you'll be in a bucket with rubber gloves and boots so you can do this, right? And you'll want to maybe make sure that you have a partner if Josie's anywhere near the truck so that you don't get in trouble. Sorry. Questions on that? Now, if we ask for, I mean, you could get the source phase voltage from this, which we... could say is maybe from right here to there, that would be this, the terminals of the source. Now we're saying what would you measure, because now you can't really measure the, let's say the A prime voltage, that's the open circuit voltage of your generator. Now you might be asking for what's the terminal voltage at your source, and that would be V sub A sub N, little a. Now that you have all of your currents, you can now simply find this voltage drop and that, well, you have the V sub A in, you basically now need to do a KVL and find this particular maybe I should have said that this was A prime and this is now the V sub A in that we want. Is that making sense? What would, 
if I ask you for the total complex power of that three-phase system, how would you find it, or can you find it? What's the total, com and here I, you would need to know, is it the complex power, is it the real power? Let's just say I'm after the real power, the average power, total real power of the system. How would you do that? Now what I'm asking is really for what's happening right here at the load. I don't know that I said that. Did I say the total? I said the total complex or total real power. So now let's say if I put another adjective in there and I said total real power at the load terminals. Then how do you find that? If I said if this is now and you have one minute left on your exam, how do you write down some information to get that half a point out of a hundred? <laughs> it's not worth it. You start throwing your pencil and calculator into your backpack and throw the exam on the table. Huh? It's not worth that half a point out of a hundred. Oh, be more positive than that. How do we approach this problem? Can you find a part to get to the total load real power? And when I say total, this is in all three phases. That's what I mean by total. What can you find so far? Do you have enough? You have V sub AB. Does that help you? You really want to concentrate on what's in the blue highlight. Question? You can use VAN and you can use the line current, I sub AA, can't you? And you could even find the complex of that phase, the complex power of that phase. The complex power of the A phase, if I did that, let's say A phase, this would be V sub A N, I sub A A star. Because you know your voltage and your current at, that, at those terminals. And now if you wanted the total complex power, Since it's balanced, you just scale that answer by 3. And if you want your total real or total average, you would just find the real part of that complex expression. Question? So now you, there are many different ways. The question was, do you have to do what I just did with the complex powers S? And the answer is no. There are many different ways of finding the load power and the total real power of the load. One would be if I wanted P sub phi of A, I could say, oh, I know the current. Let me square it and multiply by R sub load Y. And that in this problem was 4. And your current, I sub AA, was 22.5. So you square 22, you're up to 400 roughly, and you multiply it by 4, and now you have 1,600 in round numbers. 1,600 watts is what ballpark you're expecting your answer to be. That's one approach. Another approach would be, oh, and that's,
just in the A phase. Then you would get for the total, you would have three times that. Another possibility would say, well, I know V sub A in, I know I sub A in, or I'm sorry, I sub A A, and I could find the theta V minus theta I, or I could find theta of the load impedance, and that should give me the same answer that I had doing the I squared R. Maybe there'll be some round off error, but you should be able to find it that way also. And again, to get the total, you would multiply by 3. If you wanted the VARs or the reactive power, you would need to just take the sine of that angle. Questions? I have no idea. The question was did I work the problem? I have. The total load power, I have 6,075 watts. Is that what you obtained? Okay, so the total load power, real power, was 6,075 watts. So you can check your work if you want. Question? Yes. The question was, on a delta configuration, where's the neutral line go? It doesn't. There is no neutral. So if you have a delta connected load or generator, you do not have a neutral connect conductor or connection or terminal. So you don't have such a beast. And, and that's why when you're working some of these problems, the only thing you may have access to are these terminals, little a, capital A, little b, capital B. And if it's a Y configuration, the neutral conductor may not be brought out. And you may just be connecting up those terminals A, B, and C. So there is no neutral conductor in the delta configuration. Other questions? Is that okay? Are you ready to go for the exam or ready to go home? Either one, right? The answer hopefully is affirmative in all of those. I will have office hours the next couple of mornings. Today's Tuesday, isn't it? Your exam is Thursday. And there is no homework due on Thursday. Homework should have been turned in, and you should have access. I need to post. Well, I'll post these notes so indirectly you have the topics that will be included on the exam. Wait, so did you say that write, uh, yes, you have one sheet of notes available for the exam. And it can be front and back. It's an eight and a half by eleven sheet of notes. And office hours are nine to eleven Wednesday and Thursday morning. Question? Yes, I'm. I have passed back homework one, and I didn't bring it with me. I'll try to remember to bring them to office hours. I'm sorry?